This is lecture four of unit 10 on the Cold War in the 1950s. Um, and again, this is on the beginning of the Cold War chart. And what we're going to be looking at is how World War II set up for the Cold War and the impact of the Cold War on the United States in the 1950s and then slowly into the 1960s. Um, so first, remember that before World War II, we had still really been in the Great Depression. We had recovered a lot, but we were technically still in the Great Depression. And then we have that huge economic boom driven by a lot of um, U.S. government intervention. Remember, they took over and did price controls. They stopped labor strikes from happening. They told industries what to produce and how much to produce of it. And so we have this enormous economic boom after uh, World War II. There had been some fear that when the war was done, we would go back into a depression because of the decline. Um, but because pretty much we're the, the biggest superpower left standing, England once again destroyed, Germany destroyed, France destroyed, Japan destroyed, um, we're really in a position to really have a, a big boom because so much needs to be bought from us. And all of these veterans are coming back with, with money and things like that. So. We'll talk about um, why, why it is we experience this boom. So first, the GI Bill. <clears throat> if you remember after World War I, there had been the bonus army, and they had marched during Hoover's administration because they hadn't been paid their bonus. So this time, they want to avoid another problem like that. So they immediately give out the benefits, the bonuses for having fought in World War II to the veterans, and they come in two forms, and this is all within the GI Bill. One is they can get... Um, a college degree, um, sometimes multiple degrees if they want. Um, so the, the Army pays for college degrees, and it also pays for veterans to get to purchase a house or to start a business. And these are still the same benefits. We now have the post-9-11 GI Bill benefits. My husband, for example, has gotten two degrees out of the GI Bill and did buy a house with it. Um, so these are really good benefits that the, the Army figured out these, this is a really good idea, it fuels the economy because people are buying homes, they're getting degrees and getting advanced jobs and salaries. And so this, this really works out for the nation because there are so many veterans. So this leads to a, a building spree across the United States. And um, the Levittown, what you're looking at here on this slide, um, is the quintessential thing that is, is built. This is the start of the suburban development complexes. Um, these are exceptionally popular. AP likes to ask about them. This is a, a picture of one of them. Again, what we take for granted now is kind of typical development, cookie cutter houses, two car garages, all that. Um, that was a brand new idea, huge idea in the 1950s. And everyone, if remember, these are the people that had grown up during the Great Depression or had survived the Great Depression. And they want to finally enjoy prosperity um, and the things that this new kind of middle-class wealth or wealth can afford to buy. And so they're, they're going to buy these, these new um, popular homes. Um, a lot of them also moved down to the, the south. And so remember that after World War I, there was what was known as the Great Migration with lots of African Americans leaving the south. Um, going up to Detroit and Chicago and New York and the whole Harlem Renaissance, trying to get away from Jim Crow. Now you have people, a great, a huge migration back, and this is more predominantly white people, moving down to the south, down into Florida, down into the southwest to California, uh, what's known as the Sun Belt, because they're looking for um, just a, a better life. And now the biggest change is, is that air conditioning has been invented. So you see people moving to these places because they can now live there comfortably. And again, along with these Levittowns, people are buying more appliances, they're buying more cars, and just there's just generally more consumerism. Um, this time not built as much on credit and actually built on real income, unlike the 1920s. So where do, does the Cold War come from politically? So remember in the 1920s, socialism had already been on the rise. Um, so there was already a fear in the United States of socialism. Remember the Palmer raids, those uh, attacks and um, searches of suspected socialist homes without a search warrant. Um, again, a lot of the fear of immigrants and the, the decrease, that whole National Origins Act. 
the 1920s was part of that, that first Red Scare, the first fear that socialists were coming over after the communist revolution had happened in Russia. Um, there's also a fear, so if you remember during the 1930s when Hitler started to make his move into Czechoslovakia and to France and then into Poland, remember that England had tried, or um, Europe had tried appeasement where they said, okay, Hitler, you can have this, but you can't go any farther. Um, and the lesson from that is that obviously didn't stop Hitler from growing. And so there is a fear in the United States that if we revert back to isolationism and let Stalin keep spreading the, um, the Soviet Union, that it will be just like Hitler, that he'll go into Europe and he'll go into all of Asia and start moving into the Middle East and Africa. Um, that we cannot appease Stalin. We must stop him and be much more direct and deliberate than Europe was to Hitler. Again, this is the lesson of appeasement. But the primary question is, is, is the Soviet Union actually a threat to the United States? Or is it us just being paranoid? So again, the primary question, and this is the question back then, is, is the Soviet Union a threat that the United States needs to deal with? And you'll see that we have kind of two main thoughts on how to deal with the Soviet Union, all revolving around that main question. And you'll see that for the 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, that this is going to be the ongoing question. For four decades, we're trying to figure out if we actually need to be afraid of the Soviet Union. And do we fight all of these other wars really for, for no reason? So why do we call the Cold War cold? Um, and the re reason is, is that the two main opponents, the United States and the Soviet Union, never actually fight each other. Um, they never again, we never come into, we come very close to nuclear warfare, um, to bombing each other with nuclear weapons and the Cuban Missile Crisis, but we never directly fight one another. What we fight are called proxy wars, and this is where we have other countries fight our wars for us, or we fight on other countries' soil. So this would be like, say, you and your best friend are fighting, or <clears throat> your parents are fighting, for example, and they're not talking to each other, and they try to drag your, you and your siblings in by having you, you know, they say, like, have, tell your mom this, or tell your dad this, and they're, they're dragging you into it, and they're having <clears throat> you guys do all the dirty work. That is a, a proxy war. Um, the best metaphor I've ever seen for this um, or heard for this is actually like a giant peanut butter and jelly sandwich where the two sides are the Soviet Union and the United States and they're being squish, squished together and the two pieces of bread never actually touch, they never fight, but they cause all this mess because all the peanut butter and jelly spreads out and oozes out everywhere. So we never fight, but we cause all of these problems and all of this conflict and all of this death in all these other nations, Korea and China, um, Vietnam, lots of places in the Caribbean and Latin America. So all these problems elsewhere, all this other death, but the two of us never directly fight. So what should the United States do? Two ideas, two main schools of thought on this, and both of these are advisors <clears throat> uh, within the government. So George Kennan, he's a diplomat um, in the State Department, his big advice to Truman, <coughs> he sends a telegram to this effect, and Truman goes with him, is called the policy of containment. Um, and containment is um, keeping the Soviet Union within its current boundaries um, in the 40s and 50s. So you can kind of see here a picture of Stalin um, spreading out, trying to claim different parts um, for the Soviet Union. So again, containment is, his idea is that we cannot directly fight the Soviet Union. We'll lose, Hitler tried to invade the Soviet Union, he failed, Napoleon tried to invade Russia. You cannot invade Russia and win. So the thing is, is just to keep communism contained to the Soviet Union and not let them spread it elsewhere. Lipman, another um, advisor, um, he advises, he thinks the Soviet Union and communism are not a threat at all, that they will um, fizzle out and die, that it's not, not a, um, a system of government or economic, an, an economic system that will actually work, and then we should just ignore it, kind of like appeasement, and just let it go away, that it will fizzle on its own and fall apart, that communism cannot actually work, and thus it is not a threat. We don't need to worry or spend money and resources and manpower and lives 
trying to contain it. Um, Truman goes with George Kennan's policy. So the question is, you'll see in a couple, um, several units, we'll look back and say, all right, was George Kennan right or was Lippmann right? Who should we have listened to? Who would it have been more economical and better to listen to, Kennan or Lippmann? So the policies of the Cold War. Remember, Truman is president because Roosevelt dies from polio after his fourth term, or during his fourth term. So Truman takes over, and his doctrine, his policy is um, to send money towards nations that are kind of on the, on the border of the Soviet Union that could become communist or could become democratic. So if you look at this picture, uh, Greece and Turkey were right next to the Soviet Union. They were kind of swinging both ways. There were communists there. There were people pushing for democracies. They're liberated from Germany, obviously. Um, and so the United States pours money, millions of dollars, into, into Turkey and Greece to make sure they become democratic and not, um, not communist. And so again, the, the example of the Truman Doctrine in, in use is Turkey and Greece, primarily. The Eisenhower Doctrine he takes it one step further. Remember, Eisenhower was a major general during World War II. Um, when he becomes president after Truman, um, very popular, but he's a military man. And so his doctrine is to spend, to support nations um, in becoming democratic by either sending military support or money. Truman was just money. Eisenhower, being a general, sends military. Um, and the example for him is that he creates, he has created during his presidency, the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency. We had always had intelligence, but we had never centralized it. So under Eisenhower, we develop an agency that directly, that centralizes all of our covert operations um, and is also much more, and that ties it in with the military so that we have far more covert operations after Eisenhower, during and after Eisenhower. Uh, and this is where um, presidents of other nations are being assassinated, by the CIA, we've got a lot of questionable intelligence um, operations, and again, a lot of operations that are messing with the internal affairs of other nations to make sure that they become not communist. Uh, democratic would be uh, too far for most of them. Um, the other main policy during the Cold War is the Marshall Plan, and this applies to Western Europe, so it's a little bit different than the Truman Doctrine or Eisenhower, Eisenhower Doctrine. The Marshall Plan uh, was the plan to rebuild Western Europe, so France and Western Germany and England, and it's just pouring money again into those nations. They're already democratic, um, they're our, our allies, but we want to make sure that they rebuild fast because, or quickly, because they're going to be buying our products, and we want to make sure that we don't have a World War III because we didn't really fix Europe after World War I. This time we take an active part in rebuilding uh, Europe, and within 10 years it really is back to where it had been before World War II. So the Marshall Plan is an enormous success. We don't get a World War III, um, and Europe becomes a very strong economy very quickly. By, by the end of the 1950s, it's back on its feet um, and doing very well. So that is a huge success. So the international impact of the, of the Cold War in the 1950s. Um, and again, remember that our policy is to contain communism. So first, we have China. <coughs> uh, China has a communist revolution. It's been slowly brewing and having this ongoing chi Chinese revolution, but it finally becomes a communist nation in the 1950s, and the democratic groups that had been trying to maintain power flee to Taiwan. And you can see the little, little island of Taiwan to the eastern part of the map. Um, and this is why, to this day, um, there is still conflict between China and Taiwan. China thinks that Taiwan is part of it, technically is. Um, but the United States continually sends money and um, military weapons and support to Taiwan, which always makes China angry. So it's a point of tension um, between us and China because we support the democratic powers in Taiwan. Uh, and there is tension between Taiwan and China because Taiwan wants to be independent from China because it does not want to be associated with and controlled by a communist nation. So, obviously, um, communism spreads. China and the Soviet Union are very uneasy allies. They are both communist, um, but they are very different types of communist powers. So, uh, the next 
the real first real conflict, remember that I said that there's no direct conflict, they're all proxy wars. The first one is in the early 1950s, so not even within 10 years of fighting World War II, we're involved in another war, a very bloody one. Um, it's the Korean War. Um, and this starts when communist forces, so much like Europe and Berlin and Germany, um, the United States and the Soviet Union had divided up Korea to rebuild. Remember that Japan had taken over Korea, destroyed lots of it, um, killed thousands of their people, taken thousands of their women back to Japan as comfort women or prostitutes. So Korean had been ravaged, like Europe had been ravaged. So the Soviet Union is rebuilding North Korea. We are rebuilding South Korea. Um, and at one point, communist forces from North Korea invade South Korea. This sets off a, a war, a long and bloody war. Um, it's very complicated, <coughs> um, but not very well known. Um, and unfortunately, the end, and you can see a very light, the, light, the truce line that's drawn across the middle in, in brown dots, um, comes in 1953, but there is no real peace. We technically are still at war with North Korea because we never have signed a peace treaty. We only signed a ceasefire, an armistice. Um, but that line has become known as the Demilitarized Zone, the DMZ, um, and it looks kind of like this, where we've got U.S. and South Korean allied forces together um, facing off against North Korean forces. If you take my international relations course, we go much farther into detail on this, but it's still a point of tension. Um, there's all kinds of tunnels underneath. North Koreans always threatening to try and um, reinvade South Korea. South Korea is a booming economy, very democratic. North Korea is a strong dictatorship and a mess economically. Um, but still, a st and, and always trying to get nuclear weapons. So a strong point of tension. Um, there are still more troops deployed to South, American troops deployed to South Korea than we have deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, where we are actively have fought a war, fought wars in the last 10 years. So again, just to show you how tense this border still is 60 years later. Um, so again, there really isn't an end to this war, just a, a stalemate and an ongoing tension. Um, also, during this entire time, the nuclear race is building up during the 1950s. So remember, the U.S. gets the atomic bomb, but Germany was trying to build one, Soviet Union, Japan, all of them were trying to build one. And since we used ours in 1945, Russia um, also finishes its atomic bomb. It has an atomic bomb by the late 40s. Um, and we move on to hydrogen bombs, which are bigger and more explosive than atomic bombs. So you can see a picture here of a hydrogen bomb. And so we get a hydrogen bomb. The Soviet Union wants a hydrogen bomb. It builds one. So it's just a constant ramping up, just like um, when you think about World War I and militarism, where every, you know one person gets one type of weapon, the other country wants it. And just it's a constant arms race for bigger and better now nuclear weapons. Um, and Sputnik, <coughs> um, the launch of Sputnik, so it's a satellite, an unmanned satellite that Russia launches, um, kicks off a race, a space race as well. Um, and really it's the militarization of space that they want. So they want to be able to launch nuclear weapons from space um, to the United States or to Russia. And so again, Sputnik makes Americans very paranoid um, but it also increases the number of people who are studying math and science. There's lots of government support for the study of math and science because um, we want to win the engineering race in both military weapons and in um, aerospace engineering. So the domestic impact of all this, we looked at the international impact with conflicts in China, Korea, and we'll head into Vietnam in the 1960s. The domestic impact. First, on, on the left, you can see um, a cartoon of McCarthyism. So McCarthyism was in the early 50s, was the second Red Scare. It's the hunt for communists that we'll be doing in class. Um, and it was this extreme paranoia that communists were everywhere, infiltrating the United States, selling secrets to the Soviet Union. Um, and it was led by the senator, Senator McCarthy, um, who proclaimed to have a list of, of suspected communists. And again, there was, he then led this hunt where the legal um, 
means of finding information or investigation were definitely bent, if not ignored. Um, again, in this paranoid search for, for um, communists. And the House Un-American Activities Committee, the one portrayed here um, in the cars, they're just kind of running over people, pushing people to the side, and it says, oh, we're okay, we're hunting communists. It's okay if we use these wild and crazy methods. But they were the ones, they were part of the House of Representatives that was in charge of interviewing um, and blacklisting communists. And so one could be put in jail for being a communist. One could be um, accused of, charged with treason, um, executed for treason if they found that this one had been selling secrets. Um, or what usually happened <coughs> is people were blacklisted, meaning they lost their licenses to practice, for example, teachers or actors, screenwriters, a lot of people in Hollywood were accused and blacklisted. A lot of teachers, students would turn in teachers out of revenge. Um, so again, it was your, your career was over once you were blacklisted. <coughs> and you were ostracized from your neighbors, etc. The two most famous cases of accused communists, uh, first on top you see the man and woman divided by a screen. These are the Rosenbergs. Um, and there's an extra credit reading you can do on this, but these are a husband and wife scientists who were accused of selling secrets um, to the Soviet Union, nuclear secrets. Um, both were executed, and the question is that you'll see in the article is, was the execution really necessary, especially of the wife, if she had really had any part in that? And you can see the image of her being executed in the electric chair in the, in the right. Um, and then the other case is Alger Hiss, who was a member of the State Department, um, a diplomat who was accused of being a communist. And both of these cases, on such a high level, made Americans even more paranoid because they felt that our scientists were selling our secrets, our state, our diplomats, people traveling around the world conducting our diplomacy were uh, communists. Alger Hiss end ended up not being a communist. He was exonerated, but it does show um, the number of people who were, were tried in front of the House on American Activities Committee, um, and also, again, the paranoia. The end of McCarthyism came when really he went, he had already gone too far, but in the eyes of Americans in the 1950s, he went too far when he started accusing and trying veterans of World War II, who clearly had served patriotically, and Americans said, okay, whoa, way too much, way too far, and he becomes quite unpopular for how far his, his um, investigations went. They were too, too prying and too extreme. So um, we'll be coming back to a lot of these points in the skits you're going to be doing in class. But again, this is an introduction to why the Cold War uh, was being fought, how the US approached it, and how it impacted the United States.